So, welcome. Now we are finally here to complete the proof of the fundamental theorem of renormalization in the context of dimensional regularization. We have prepared the proof extensively by setting up various methods and uh, various technical details. We have done an example which basically uh, works in the same way as the general proof, but now we really are here to complete the proof of the fundamental theorem by induction. Induction over the number of loops, uh, treating first one loop, then two loop graphs, and so on. Uh, and uh, today we will do a step from L to L plus one, um, so that the proof goes to infinitely high loop numbers. Let us remind us of the theorem that we want to prove. It's really the fundamental theorem that in essence tells us renormalization works, and renormalization works in the context of dimensional regularization. So what does it mean? You take a Feynman graph G, an arbitrary graph, and you apply recursively the subtraction of subdiagrams using lower order results which have been calculated before. Then once you have subtracted all the subdivergencies, in other words, you add all counterterm graphs, then what remains is an overall divergence. And one of the statements is, about this overall divergence. Namely, the overall divergence is local so that it can be cancelled by adding a counterterm Lagrangian which has the usual properties of Lagrangians. Second, once you have added this counterterm Lagrangian, the overall divergence has cancelled and what remains is finite. And then the next statement is about the finite remainder which is a C-infinity function in the physics variables and it is analytic in epsilon so that the limit epsilon going to zero can be taken. So these are the two elements of this general theorem and now we want to prove them uh, by induction. Let me illustrate uh, in more detail what we need to do by again uh, showing you this six loop diagram and uh, writing down a formula which is what we really need to do technically. So let me write the formula here. So we start with a Feynman graph G, which has many, many loops, like for example, a six loop graph. Then our uh, inductive procedure is that we apply our subrenormalization operation to it. Uh, so we have rewritten the R operation in terms of a improved forest formula, which now looks like this. So we go to sectors and uh, we always fix a particular sector today. Then we apply first one minus th1 onto the graph, which means, so in this example, h1 is this subgraph here, the one loop subdiagram. Then this operation means take the graph and add to it the counterterm graph where this is replaced by its counterterm. Then the counterterm for this h1 has been calculated before in a one loop calculation. The result of this counterterm only depends on the graph h1 computed in isolation. Then you add this counterterm graph to the full graph G and you have subtracted the subdivergence. Then something remains. Then the next step is you apply onto it one minus TH2. In the example H2 is this one loop diagram here. So again, you add the counterterm graph where this is replaced by its counterterm where the counterterm is computed in isolation. And then overall here you have actually four diagrams, namely the full diagram and the two diagrams with one counter term each and the diagram with both diagrams replaced by counter terms. And so it goes on. And this is the induction that we will do. So induction over the number of factors here. In other words, we will do the induction over the number of loops which have been treated by subrenormalization. Then here is some intermediate result, let's say THL. Then L is the number of um, sub-loop uh, sub divergences that have been treated, but our full graph G might have many more loops than this L, so uh, really we would have to go on. But at some point we need to stop and do our induction from uh, loop number L to loop number L plus one. Now, 
this is what we need to uh, work with. And now we want to formulate our induction hypothesis. And uh, in order to formulate our induction hypothesis, let's discuss for a moment what is actually the difficulty in setting up an inductive proof. You know many inductive proofs from elementary mathematics, and often these inductive proofs are rather simple and straightforward. And also here, actually, the difficulty uh, of our actual proof going from L to L plus 1 will be not so difficult. What is really difficult, and I would even say it's a form of an art, if you want, what is really difficult is to figure out the correct form of your induction hypothesis. And this can be illustrated here with our example uh, of this uh, fundamental theorem of renormalization. So imagine you uh, want to prove the fundamental theorem, which basically tells us uh, at any loop order, the Feynman graphs will become finite by renormalization. Okay, then the first guess might be we use as an induction hypothesis, at the L loop level, everything is finite. And then you go on to the L plus one loop level, and what you can work with is only your induction hypothesis, so at L loop everything is finite. And then how do you go on to prove that at the L plus one level also everything is finite? You will not manage to do it because you don't have enough details to work with. So your induction step cannot be done because your induction hypothesis is not specific enough. So you need to have some more specific uh, induction hypothesis, which gives you more details that you can work with in the proof. So let us imagine something else, something much more specific. So for example, uh, take any of these operations. You do uh, the subloop renormalization up to a certain point, and then you might say, ah, okay, uh, my induction hypothesis is that after doing it up to a certain point, the result is completely finite, and the result is a polynomial in all quantities and exponentially damped, and so on and so forth. Then you have really enough details to go on to the next step. However, it's wrong, because if you go up to a certain point, the result is not finite. We know it by experience, and uh, if you go up to a certain point, the divergence is actually even non-local. So it's, uh, if we go up to a certain point only, don't do it completely, then the intermediate results are really complicated. They are divergent and the divergences are non-local. So uh, your induction hypothesis also cannot be too specific and cannot be too strong because then it might be wrong. So what you see is you need to figure out uh, the correct balance for your induction hypothesis. It should contain sufficiently many details to give you everything you need to go from L to L plus one but it cannot be too specific because otherwise the hypothesis itself uh, is wrong, okay? And how do you find uh, what is the correct hypothesis? As I said, I would say it's an art and here you see it. You cannot derive it. You will need to have a very deep understanding of your problem until you are able to write down the correct induction hypothesis. And I can even give you an example from a current research project that we do in our group where we write a paper on such an inductive proof. Also there, uh, initially we had a version of the proof and a version of the induction hypothesis. Then we tried to make the proof more elegant and uh, we failed, but we saw that uh, maybe not everything in the induction hypothesis is actually needed in the proof, so we changed the induction hypothesis and then suddenly it turned out that the proof could be done in a more elegant way. After having the more elegant proof, one could see that the induction hypothesis could be simplified once again, and so it was an iterative process until uh, one really have, has found maybe an optimum balance between the hypothesis and the elegance of the proof. And so here I also played around uh, a lot on how to formulate the induction hypothesis such that the inductive proof goes as smoothly as possible, but uh, of course the hypothesis should be correct as well. And uh, in the end I have to say I ended up with basically uh, the same as what Brighton, Lohner, Meison have done, so maybe they have really found the optimum formulation. And what we will do today is almost a copy of what they did. Maybe I'm a little bit more explicit in a few details 
Um, but uh, anyway, the logic is really the same. So let me now write down the actual statement of the, um, of the induction. So the statement is the following. Consider a one particle irreducible graph G and uh, let us fix a sector given by a maximal forest and a labeling. And this uh, sector will always be fixed. Let me not repeat all the notation. The notation is as in our section 3.5, where we introduced all the variables uh, specific to the sector and all the subgraph definitions. Just to stress, it also in written form, all the results and all the quantities that we will write down today and in particular now are specific to this sector. So therefore, in principle, uh, the quantities should have an index denoting the sector, but we will omit that index, but really it should be there, okay, just to simplify the notation. Then uh, previously, we had this uh, general loop prefactor called CD, and uh, I will now be specific on that, almost specific. So we have some d0 dimensional value and then uh, this deviates from that by an order epsilon contribution and we will now fix this to be uh, this mu to the power 2 epsilon. However, to be a little bit general, I call it mu tilde and then later this mu tilde could be set either to the original mu or to mu times a factor if we want to have some freedom. But essentially it's uh, the normal uh, scaling with this dimensional regularization um, mass mu. So this could, uh, depending on what we put in here, it would be what is called minimal subtraction or um, the so-called modified minimal subtraction MS bar if we rescale our mu uh, with an appropriate factor, or we could go uh, anything in between. Okay, but that is fixed. It's not uh, very important, so that let's give that a frame. This is our starting point, and then we apply this operation. Then we apply this operation. Let's give it a name, Rx of G. So this is a partially renormalized expression. We take our graph and treat a few subgraphs, of course in the correct ordering, up to loop number L. So in this example, we might fix something to, to help our uh, visualization. So let's say we have treated this one, we have treated this one. So we are at L equal 2. And then the next time we would treat H3, which is this one. And then, uh, okay, if we have treated these three graphs, then uh, uh, this X corresponds to the set of treated graphs. And let me write down at least this definition once again. So X is the set of treated graphs. So it's H1 up to HL. In the example, it would be H1, H2, H3. And uh, then there are the treated maximal graphs, x0, our hl is always one of the treated maximal graphs because of the correct ordering. And then there are some other maximal graphs, let's call them m1 up to m capital S, just like we did in section 3.5. So in this example, if we go to the third graph, then this is a maximal subgraph. But this here is not a maximal subgraph, 
got uh, that two loop graph here that is a maximal subgraph. So if we go three graphs, then we have two maximal subgraphs, namely this one and here the two loop graph. Okay, so this is notation. Then let me say after, oops, evaluating this expression here. So partially sub-renormalize our graph where we have introduced the notation and uh, also evaluating all the integrals ti and beta k integrals for these treated subgraphs for h1 up to hl. So all the lines uh, in these subgraphs have certain betas and t's and these are integrated over. And the other lines outside of those treated graphs, they are not yet integrated over. So then we have really a partially renormalized and partially integrated expression. And now our induction is about the functional form of this intermediate result. We obtain r of x of g is equal. Now, as I said, this is complicated. It's only partially renormalized. Therefore, it's still divergent, and the divergence is still non-local. But uh, we have canceled some subdivergences, and therefore, this must be reflected somehow in some sort of finiteness in the result. And this is the magic to write now down how this should look like. And uh, in a way which is compatible with the fundamental theorem we want to prove and which is also true. Okay, this is a sum of terms like the following loop number, uh, loop factor d0 to the power lg minus l times integral over product of i not in x of this mu tilde to the 2 epsilon times dti over ti times ti times xi i to the power minus omega hi bar plus 2 epsilon times z h i tilde. Don't worry if you don't know what I mean by omega h bar. This is not yet introduced and I will introduce it uh, in a moment. Then it goes on times product of all the maximal subgraphs m element x0. So this m is all the maximal subgraphs. It contains the L loop graph hl and all these what we called m1, m2 and so on all the maximal subgraphs, including HL. And for each one, we get the following. Psi m to the power minus omega m, and this is the normal omega m without bar, so the power counting degree of the maximal subgraph m. Now comes the point where we say how uh, the functional form of this intermediate result looks like. It has some analytic parts and some non-analytic parts. And here come the non-analytic parts in the form of our functions f from the set j and j tilde from last time. And I call them f tilde subscript m with argument mu tilde times, uh, sorry, xi m comma epsilon times a function g, small g with subscript big g comma x. And then we set all the u tilde variables to zero. On the next blackboard I will write down a lot of details on this expression. But let me first explain uh, how, how you can read it. First of all, um, let's go through it. The loop factors here uh, initially, our integral has, of course, as many uh, factors like this as there are loops LG. 
but we have integrated over already L loops, therefore uh, these L additional factors are already incorporated inside of those functions. So what you have here at the end is basically the result of the integration over these subloop variables. So this is the result here, or more specifically the product of these two functions is the result. And so the trick is, and the observation, is that the final result after applying this partial renormalization has a factorized form where uh, we have one factor corresponding to a normal function g, which properties to be discussed, and these functions f tilde, which are non-analytic in the t variables or these arguments here. Okay, and then uh, what we have here in the first line is simply the integration measure for all the remaining loops. So I not element x means, of course, all the other subgraphs in the sector, but uh, which are not yet treated. So these are all the remaining ones, h, l plus one, and so on. And for each of them, we have this integration measure. So dt over t, uh, okay, and I forgot one. Actually, I forgot the beta integration, so also, Sorry about that, all the betas, beta k. And let me not um, write down more. These are all the remaining betas for the remaining graphs. Let me write it on the next blackboard. So we have the integration measure for all the remaining variables. And in the integration measure, there appears in particular this uh, combination with the t variables and the size, which are always the remaining t's for bigger graphs, to this power. And this is not exactly the same power that we encountered before, but you will soon see the, see the connection. Then we have here these numerator factors which contain derivatives with respect to u variables, but they might also contain masses like quark masses in the propagator numerator and so on. And then in the second line we have the interesting part of the result, which is uh, our claim that after partial subrenormalization, uh, we can write the intermediate result in this form. And this is precisely the way that is specific enough to go on from one step to the next, but it is also correct, as you will see, of course. So now let me give a lot of comments. Let's go through the expression step by step. The first thing uh, is this uh, expression sum of terms like. This has a precise meaning. Namely, it means that actually uh, the first line, there is no sum. The first line is universal, but in the second line, we have actually several such products. So here we wrote down one example where for each maximal graph there is one function and there is one function for the subrenormalized expression, but actually we have a sum over such products and we were just too lazy to write it down. So actually we have here a sum over i, let's say f tilde m, uh, let's say superscript i times g, uh, g comma x, superscript i, and there are just several such factors, uh, such such terms, okay, um, product over all the m's. This is what we have. And so uh, the sum of terms only refers to the last line. And in the proof, we uh, will treat one uh, term in this sum and uh, then what we will prove holds, of course, for any term, and uh, therefore we don't need to uh, keep track always of this index. Then the next element that you see here is the uh, newly defined omega h bar. So this is a new object, but its definition is very obvious. Namely, let us simply say uh, we have the well-known power counting degree of some subgraph h. This is defined by the loop number, the 
denominator factors and the numerator factors in the propagators. And uh, we can decompose this um, into the power counting degree of all the lines and vertices in the subgraph. So let me write down the formula. So this is omega h bar plus the sum over all the maximal subgraphs of this graph h uh, omega m without bar. So what does that mean? So take our graph h2 here, which is a two-loop graph. The two-loop graph with a certain power counting degree, and of course the power counting uh, of the overall graph uh, is a combination of all the numerators and denominators of the outer lines and of this subgraph. So this is the overall power counting degree. And now we can say that this has a maximal subgraph, which is here just this single one-loop graph. This has a power counting degree. And what we are interested in is the difference. What is the extra contribution of the outer lines to the power counting degree of the full graph? And therefore, we write the overall degree as the sum of the uh, inner power counting degree plus the rest. And the rest is uh, this omega h bar here. And uh, remember the notation h bar is the definition of uh, h divided by all its maximal subgraphs. So here this would be this uh, two loop graph divided by the one loop um, subgraph. So it would be this graph. And uh, so the notation basically means the power counting degree which only comes from these lines which you now see without this subgraph. So it's a very natural definition and actually it turns out to be useful. And uh, I will now just write down without uh, explanation, this is the same as if you take all subgraphs H prime, which are subgraphs or equal to this graph H in the sector, always in the sector, and uh, simply add up all these uh, different H bars for all the um, subgraphs. So uh, we will discuss it in more detail later in the course of the proof, but um, it's essentially clear because you can partition any big graph into all its H bar components by going to smaller and smaller graphs. So each line in the graph belongs to one unique such H bar. And then of course the overall power counting degree is just the sum of all these uh, H bar power countings. So this is uh, apparently useful to write the integration measure in this way, even though uh, previously we didn't do it like this. Next comment is on the variables. What are the variables in our graph and in our expression? So of course, uh, we have integrated over the t's and betas for all the treated subgraphs. So what remains are the t's and betas for the remaining graphs. So we have the ti's where i or hi is not in the set x. So it has not yet been treated and uh, then those t's for the remaining graphs, they still exist. Then the same for the betas, and actually also the u's, u tilde k, uh, exist only for the remaining graphs. So, K should be in some remaining graph, and what that simply means is that K is an element of our big graph G divided by all these uh, treated graphs, um, and uh, the simple way to write it is G divided by X0, which is the set of all the maximal subgraphs. Then if K is element of that, then it has not yet been dealt with. And then for these lines, so this denotes a set of lines. For all these not treated lines, there exist still betas and u variables. Then we have, of course, the interesting physics variables, and they are rescaled. So there are q's. q's for the subgraphs and m tildes for the subgraphs. <coughs> 
and uh, they exist for all graphs, also for the treated ones, because if we have treated a graph, then the final result still depends on the corresponding momentum and the corresponding mass. And uh, so these are this subgraph aware partitionings of momenta and masses. And um, then the Qs and the Ms and the Us are rescaled. Now, just to be clear, so the Us can be uh, associated with the individual lines, but they can also be associated with the subgraphs. And then, uh, as we already said before, some Us don't exist anymore. So some of these uh, U variables for some subgraphs don't exist anymore, but for the Qs and the Ms, everything still exists. So these are different sets here. But all of them which exist are rescaled, and the rescaling is done only with the remaining T variables. So that is what we also encountered in the example. So if we progress in our sub-renormalization, we need to re-rescale the variables. Initially, all these variables are rescaled with all the t's, and uh, um, but then uh, some t's are integrated over, and therefore they must be uh, dropped from the rescaling, which amounts to a re-rescaling of these variables. So as an example, we can do it here for this um, case. Let us imagine we are exactly at this point. Let's say uh, yeah, we we are before, let's say we go one step higher. We also treat H4. Then we have treated H1, H2, H3, and H4. And the next step that we should be doing would be H5, but we have not yet done it. So we have only done up to H4. So then what uh, are the variables that we have to deal with? Then we need, for example, the U's. So U for H1 doesn't exist anymore. U for H2, H3, H4 doesn't exist anymore. What exists is U H5 and U H6 which is the use for these two lines, so for the white lines, and for these white lines. These use still exist, and all the other use don't exist anymore. How are they uh, rescaled? So the rescaling for this U5, given by UH5 without tilde, so the rescaling is only done with the remaining Ts. So let's say the remaining Ts are T5 and T6. So what is the rescaling of these lines here in this H5 subgraph? They must be rescaled with T5 and C T6. And what is the rescaling for the lines in uh, the subgraph 6? That is only done with T6. So this is UH6 divided by T6, just like that. Then we have uh, momentum variables, QH5, QH6, but we also have QH1, QH2, and so on. So the Qs are complete. So the QH5 is rescaled in the same way. So QH5 is QH5 times T5 times T6. So this is QH6 times T6. Now, the first non-trivial thing, so QH1, how is it rescaled? Just to make it clear. QH1. It is this subgraph. And originally it would be rescaled by T1 times T6. But now we drop the rescaling with T1. So what that means is that this QH1 is only rescaled by T6 now. Okay. How about QH2? QH2 initially was rescaled by uh, T2 is here, so it's a subgraph of H3, of H5, and of H6, so it was rescaled by T2, T3, 
T5 and T6. Now the rescaling with T2 is dropped simply. The rescaling with T3 is also dropped. So this is now rescaled just by T5 and T6. And so on. So this is how it works. So these are the variables. So what you have here now on the blackboard, this is the set of variables that we have uh, at the point where we have treated our uh, graphs in the set X. And uh, you could go on here yourself. And the same applies to the mass variables and, uh, and for the other Qs. So these are the variables. So it depends on the Ts, the betas, and all Qs and all Ms, but uh, on the rescaled variables, where rescaled is now done in this way. And then it depends also on epsilon. These are the variables. Now, let us discuss the functions which appear in uh, our intermediate result. So let me remove these variables here and let us continue to discuss the functions which appear in the result, which contain, of course, the essence of our statement. So what is the essence of our statement? Let me go on here. The first function, or let's say, uh, let's begin with this uh, most interesting function, this g, small g with index g and x. This is a function which is specific to the graph G and the treated graphs as uh, the indices um, denote. And, and of course, uh, X and everything is specific to the sector, so of course these are specific to the sector. And actually there are many such functions because we have this sum of terms like. Good, but any of them is specific to the graph and to the sector. And um, good, then these functions are analytic in epsilon. So they have no one over epsilon poles, they are analytic and in them you could take the limit epsilon going to zero and they are C infinity functions in all the other variables. And there is no explicit dependence on the outermost T variables. And this is all we um, have seen in our examples. So, and uh, the way to think about this is that initially, this is just this uh, usual integrant of the Feynman diagrams, namely the semantic polynomial d tilde g to the minus d over two times e to the i w g. This is the starting expression for this before we do anything. And this has, of course, all these properties. And then we do sub-renormalization, and all the results of the sub-renormalization, of course, add to that, but these properties remain. Okay, so this is the way to think about this G. Now about the Fs. The Fs are exactly what we discussed in the previous section, namely they are those functions which encapsulate the non-C infinity behavior in the T variables. So, as I wanted to indicate in the notation, these f tilde variables depend on the maximum subgraph, M. They are elements of our set J tilde and with which indices L and K, where L is of course uh, the L from above. So after treating L subdivergencies, this, this function here is in the set with index L. So this is really the maximum treated loop number. Then, this was the one over epsilon power power, so epsilon to the minus k appears in those functions. And uh, the requirement is k is smaller or equal than L. So we cannot have, so, and uh, actually as you remember, these functions here are analytic in epsilon. So they allow the limit epsilon going to zero. 
but they contain explicit one over epsilon to the k. It's just that the numerator of these functions cancels the one over epsilon pole. This is how these functions are constructed. So they're very tricky functions. They contain t to the epsilon, which means they are not analytic in t, but they are analytic in epsilon, even though they contain explicitly one over epsilon to the k. But uh, this inequality here already indicates this uh, thing, which is the final theorem, namely that uh, at the n-loop level, only epsilon to the l divergences can appear and not higher one over epsilon poles than this. So this is encapsulated here. And so now these functions have an index m, which is one of the maximal treated subgraphs in our uh, treated graphs. And uh, they depend not only on this treated subgraph, but they depend actually on the entire chain building up our subgraph. So let me write this down. This is specific to the, I would call it subgraph chain. We had already a symbol for it, x sub m, which is the set of graphs in our uh, set x, which are subgraphs of m. So this is the set of all graphs h prime, uh, which are subgraphs or equal to m, and um, sorry, h prime element in our set of treated graphs x. So for example, in uh, our um, case here, we have treated up to h5, for example. Then the maximal subgraphs are h1, h4, h3. This is not a maximal subgraph, but this is a maximal subgraph. This triangle is a subgraph, and the two-loop triangle is also a maximal subgraph. And then there will be such functions for each maximal subgraph. So at, if we are at this stage here, then we have functions corresponding to uh, this subgraph, and that function depends only on this graph itself. Then we have a function which depends on this triangle, and it depends only on this triangle, on, and not on the outer stuff which is around the triangle. And then we have a function which is specific to the two-loop subdiagram, and this function is specific to this chain of the two-loop diagram and the one-loop diagram inside of it. So this is what the sentence uh, tells us. So we have such functions for all the maximal subgraphs, and each of them depends only on the graphs inside of it and not on the surroundings. Let me write this explicitly. So this is independent of the bigger graph G. Uh, the only dependence on the bigger graph G is using the argument. So the function itself, which function is it, uh, has this property, but the argument that we put inside of the function then has a dependence on the bigger graph via this psi. Only the argument depends on G. But the choice of the function itself does not. Right, now one final comment is important, and I think I will write the final comment into this free space here. This belongs to our set of comments, and it is also part of the induction hypothesis. By the way, everything I write here is part of the induction hypothesis, and that is what I said in the beginning. Uh, maybe it's a form of an art or wherever, whether you like it or not, but anyway, uh, this is what we state. And all of this is what we need to prove by going from L to L plus one. And so the next statement is also something we need to use and also prove for the next step. And it is our proposition D. Proposition D, which was, uh, I write it down, um, oh, sorry. so let me just say the sentence, folds for all remaining graphs. H tilde, which are 
not in X, but of course in the set. Let's write it like this, our element of the full forest, but without our set of treated graphs. And what I mean by this is the following statement. D by dt h tilde to omega h tilde times some set h tilde applied now on this function g comma x, which is the generalization of our dg times e to bi w g. So applied onto this at t h tilde equals zero. So this is the generalization of what we had in our proposition D, which was on this uh, derivatives uh, relating full graphs and subgraphs and reduced graphs. And so we showed uh, long ago that this is valid for the fundamental E to the IWG. And now we say that it also holds for this remainder function, small g, which uh, depends on the already treated graphs. Okay, so this does not have the form like this anymore, but it is much more complicated. But still we can do this operation, set th tilde to zero. So now here this th tilde is some variable in the middle. It is uh, some subgraph which is bigger than the treated graphs, but smaller than the full graph. Okay, and this is equal to the following product, xi h tilde to the power omega h tilde then u h tilde, this insertion operator for this intermediate graph h tilde. Then we have here d by dt h tilde to the omega h tilde set h tilde g h tilde comma x intersection with h tilde in quotation marks, bracket closed, t h tilde equals zero. And this insertion operator is applied onto the corresponding g function for the graph g over h tilde, comma, x over h tilde in quotation marks. So this is the direct generalization of what we had in our proposition d. It relates derivatives that we need in our calculation for the full graph to derivatives of the re, uh, subgraph and the reduced graph. Okay, and uh, now the statement is written down for our function g, including all the details. And uh, this is part of the induction hypothesis, and we need to establish that it also holds at the next level because then we can go on with our induction. And it is clear that we need something like this because we always used this proposition D uh, also in our examples. Very good. So um, let me just say, I hope it fits here. Uh, these functions here are of course uh, not talked about so far, but clearly uh, we can do this um, induction um, for any big graph. So G is just a name. We can do what we do for G using the same subgraph chain also for a smaller graph H tilde. So H tilde is part of the same uh, sector. Therefore, we can apply onto H tilde the same uh, sub-renormalization as we can onto G. And therefore, this function with H tilde index and the subsector is defined in the identical way. And if we do the induction, then whatever we can prove for G on the L loop level for sure also holds for h tilde. And similarly for g over h tilde, this is also a graph which is part of our sector. Therefore, this uh, can be constructed in the identical way. And what we have established by induction will automatically hold for these two functions too. But what we uh, need to say is what I mean by these uh, sec uh, sets here. So this x over h tilde prime, uh, sorry, h tilde in quotation marks. This is the following set. So it's the appropriate uh, set of treated graphs for this. So uh, this has uh, the subgraph h tilde reduced to a point. 
Therefore, we need to take our treated graphs and always reduce any appearance of this to a point. So what that means precisely, in particular, given that this H tilde is a bigger graph than any of the ones we have treated, so this is very simple. So for all Hi in uh, our set of treated graphs, this graph Hi divided by H tilde in quotation marks is defined either as the graph itself if it's disjoint from that, so then the reduction doesn't do anything. So if it's disjoint, then uh, this just means take the same graph. But if uh, that is a bigger graph than this, so Hi is contained in H tilde, then the reduction gives zero. So, and the third case cannot appear. H tilde cannot be a subgraph of Hi because uh, it's not yet treated, but the treatment is going according to the nesting, and therefore these are the only two cases that can appear. So, this is our set of graphs. So, if you read it, uh, what I wrote is um, the obvious thing which you need to do in order to define a sector for the reduced graph. But what it boils down to is simply take all the treated graphs which are not subgraphs of H tilde. So this is a very simple set. Let's also uh, write down what uh, the other set means, X intersection with H tilde. So this is not meant literally, but in quotation marks. And what I really mean is uh, from each graph in the treated graphs, take the intersection with this graph here. And uh, so the intersection is empty if these uh, graphs are disjoint. And uh, then the only thing that can happen is that a graph here is a subgraph of that, and then we simply take that graph. So we take all graphs H prime in our uh, treated graphs X, which are subgraphs of H tilde. So then the two sets have unusual names, but uh, they mean really something simple, namely either take all the subgraphs uh, of H tilde in X or take all the disjoint graphs uh, of H tilde in X. This is what we need. And for this definition, our proposition D holds in precisely this way. This ends our statement of the uh, induction. So this is the statement. We um, do partial subrenormalization up to the L-loop level. Then our result still has non-local divergences and is very complicated, but this is how it looks like. And it can be written as an integral over remaining T and beta variables. And the integrand has this form. It has a C infinity and analytic part, and it has a part which consists of those uh, non-C infinity functions of T and epsilon. And uh, each part here has a very well-defined structure, depends only on the sectors of uh, treated graphs in the appropriate ways. The arguments are clear, and the behavior of the functions are also um, clarified. And so this is now really the precise statement that can be used for the induction. And so now let us do the induction. 